everyone. Welcome to the lecture on ecology. This is kind of an introduction to ecology. We're going to touch on um, some of the major important points and things that ecologists study, uh, but there's a lot more to it than just what we can cover in one lecture. Our objectives for this lecture are to demonstrate an understanding of the principles of ecology and how they relate to the human community. You should be able to define an ecosystem, describe the structure of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, explain how energy drives geochemical cycles of elements in an ecosystem. You'll be able to discuss pyramids of energy, biomass, and numbers of an ecosystem, and discuss the effects of human activities on ecosystems. <clears throat> You'll be able to explain why precipitation and temperature or altitude can influence the type of biome existing in a given area. You'll be able to identify the characteristics that vary between biomes and provide examples. And you'll be able to explain the competitive exclusion principle. You will also be able to describe the process of succession. So ecology is the scientific study of the interactions between organisms and the environment. The ecological study of species involves both biotic or living and abiotic or non-living influences. Biotic influences may be things like other organisms, their behaviors or interactions between organisms. And abiotic non-living factors are things like temperature, water, salinity, sunlight, soil type, etc. When we study ecology, we um, do so in a hierarchical framework. So the most specific or narrow fields of ecology are organismal ecology. We might be studying a single individual or a handful of individuals. Above that is population ecology, community ecology, where we have different populations that interact with each other. And ecosystem ecology is different communities and their environment. Landscape ecology is a larger scale and global ecology would be ecological patterns or processes that happen on the scale of the whole planet. <clears throat> All right, so let's start with energy, energy pyramids and the rule of 10. So this is a sample energy pyramid. You notice the bottom layer here would be like the base of the food chain. And then you're working your way up in trophic levels. So it's always producers at the bottom. So this could be something like um, grass, right? So if there's a thousand pounds of producers or grass in a given ecosystem, if you go up one level from there, what's something that eats grass? Maybe something like um, a rabbit, right? So if there's a thousand pounds of grass, then there can there should be or we'd expect there to be about a hundred pounds of rabbits because only 10 percent of the energy makes it up each level of the food chain as energy is transferred remember every time energy is transferred it's always some of it that gets lost right so energy transfers are always inefficient usually that energy is lost as heat <clears throat> and that's what we see here 10% of the energy at any one level on the food chain makes it up to be available as food at the next level up on the food chain. So a thousand pounds of grass can support 100 pounds of rabbits. And something that eats rabbits might be foxes, right? A hundred pound population of rabbits can support 10 pounds of foxes. And something that might eat a fox could maybe be, let's say a coyote. 10 pounds of foxes will support one pound of coyote, right? So this is a really great way to think about how ecosystems are limited in size, how predator populations are particularly limited in size by the productivity or the energy available within an ecosystem. So you should be familiar with this rule of 10 and how energy pyramids are a way of visualizing how much energy or biomass is available at each level, uh, each trophic level in the food chain. And of course, all this is powered by the sun, right? Solar energy. All 
All right. There's a common assertion that eating lower on the food chain is more environmentally friendly way to behave. Consider what you've learned about energy and energy pyramids in ecosystems and take a stance on this assertion. You, there's no doodle sheet for this, but you can write your answers here on the slide. So do you think that it's a beneficial, like if you were to eat um, grasshoppers aren't a good example, but say uh, like corn is a grass, right? Is it better for the environment to eat corn or to eat fish based on this? How many acres of land would it take to produce enough grass or enough corn to support a human versus how many trout would it take to support a human? So think about those things. All right, habitat versus niche. These are some other important vocabulary terms. So, and they're often confused by people. Habitat is the place where you can find things. It's something you could point to on a map, right? A niche is the job or role that a species plays in an ecosystem. And we think of this as kind of an n-dimensional hypervolume. But basically, if you could think of all the specific ways that an organism fits into an ecosystem, that would be its niche. So the niche of an American alligator is habitat's part of it, right? That it inhabits the Everglades or swamps. But it's also that it, um, it's a predator. It also modifies its habitat um, by digging wallows, which impact other organisms around it. Um, so the niche is kind of a term we use to encompass the role that an organism plays in the ecosystem. Um, and it's much more complicated than just saying a swamp, right, or predator. A competitive exclusion principle holds that two species can occupy the same ecological, no two species can occupy the same ecological niche, sorry, in the same place at the same time. So if American alligators are living in the same part of the, in one part of the Everglades, there can't be another species that would fill that same role in the ecosystem in the same place at the same time. So the less fit species or the one that is less competitive in that role has to evolve into a slightly different niche or move to a different like location or go extinct. But two species can't occupy the same ecological space at the same time. That's the competitive exclusion principle. And it's actually led to some really cool speciation events in very small areas, like warblers. So in Michigan, actually, all these species visit Michigan and breed here. Um, and warblers have done a great job of specializing their niches. So each of these five species of warbler nests in pine trees in Michigan. So they come back from the Bahamas or Mexico or whatever warm tropical place they overwinter in. And actually, they should be returning very quickly to Michigan. Um, usually we start seeing them show up in March or April. But anyways, what they've done, because they can't occupy the same niche at the same place at the same time, is they've divided the pine trees that they all breed in into different locations. So the Cape May warbler breeds at the very top of the trees. Um, and they, they use the areas with new needles and buds. The Blackburnian warbler can use a greater fraction of the tree. And they also take advantage of the branches so they can go deeper into the tree itself. The middle half of the tree is utilized by black-throated green warblers to nest in. Bay-breasted warblers have further subdivided, so they capitalize on the deeper branches in the middle of the tree that the black-throated warblers can't access. And the yellow-rumped warbler uses the bottom half of the tree. So even though you'd find all five of these species potentially nesting in the same tree, they're not using the same parts of the trees. They've specialized their niche 
so that they're not directly competing with one another and they can coexist indefinitely. And that's a really special thing. Um, if this, if the competitive exclusion principle weren't true, there'd be no reason for all these different species of warbler, right? They could all just coexist in the same place. So competitive exclusion principle actually is a force that helps to drive evolution or speciation of new species. All right, let's talk about some abiotic factors that are important in ecosystems. So we have climate. Climate is the long-term prevailing weather conditions in a particular area. So kind of like the weather you'd expect in a given place. And it's a factor of the temperature, the precipitation patterns, the amount of sunlight they receive, and wind patterns. Macroclimate is what we usually think of, like Michigan has a temperate macroclimate, right? We have all four seasons, um, and each of our seasons is generally relatively moderate, right? We don't have winters like they get up in the Yukon, and our summers are not nearly as hot as what southern states like Louisiana and Florida experience. We're in the middle. But microclimate is different. So imagine you're an ectotherm like a snake and you've just um, woken up for the day and you need to go warm up. Where will you go? Well, probably you're going to look for a sunny place, right? You might go um, lay out on a dark rock or a roadside that's dark and is exposed to the sun because it will be warmer on a dark rock in the sun than it would be in the shade under a tree, right? And that, those small scale temperature differences, those are called microclimate. So it's generally slightly different in different places on the same landscape. Um, and that would be microclimate. But we're seeing very tiny differences in temperature, precipitation, maybe humidity, or sun or wind exposure. All right, climate changes. So some species may not survive shifting ranges. So climate change, global climate change is something I think we're all familiar with. Um, average global temperatures are warmer now than they have been historically. <clears throat> and it's a pattern that seems like it will continue. And as areas warm, we see some species are able to adapt their ranges. They can move into new areas that they were previously not, uh, not able to reach. Um, a good example of that is, sorry, a good example of this is um, the American possum. So um, this part of Michigan was kind of at the upper ranges for uh, Virginia possums. And now with global climate change, it's warmer and warmer further and further north. The possums are able to, they're actually moving further north and expanding the ranges that they can inhabit. And while that's good for opossums, it may not be good for things that occupy the same niche as an opossum that were able to live in, say, northern Michigan or southern Ontario. Now they have to compete with opossums. So some species may not survive these shifting ranges. This is something interesting that I think will become an increasing um, issue uh, within our lifetimes. We're going to have to decide, is it a human's role to intervene and try and save or conserve species that are being displaced by those that move, or um, even if we have areas that are becoming too warm and animals can't stay there and they're moving further north, should those places further south that are losing species because it's too warm, should they be trying to save them there if the climate's no longer appropriate? So there, there will be things, uh, decisions that your generation will have to make decisions on relating to climate change and the distributions or ranges of species. All right, biogeography. This is the geographic distribution of species. And there are some important factors here. So dispersal or movement away from an area of origin, 
That would be like possums moving further north as the climate warms, right? Behavior, so habitat selection, also determines why we find organisms where we do, right? Like camels are all desert species, so you wouldn't expect to find them in the Amazon rainforest over here. And biotic factors, so things like other species that may be competitors, food resources, pollinators, predators, these things are all important biogeographical things. And then lastly, abiotic factors. Things like temperature, water, oxygen, salinity, rocks and soil. Oh, all right. And then one other thing that's not quite explicitly labeled here is um, the distribution of species can also be impacted by historical um, locations of the continents, really. So we have camels that live on Africa, Asia, and South American continents. How in the world did this species get to South America, right? With the whole Pacific Ocean in between them. Well, we know these continents used to fit together into a single landmass, right? Pangaea. And that actually dates back to when camels first evolved. So these land masses used to be connected. And that's why we see the animals located on the continents that we do. All right, global climate patterns and sunlight density. So we know that the equator gets the most sunlight, right? But what does that really mean? It gets the most sunlight. Well, the land or, or the, the surface of the earth at the equator is most directly in line with the rays of the sun. And as we go further north, we're actually moving at more of an angle from the surface of the earth to the angle of the sunlight that's coming in. And so that same beam of light where all that energy used to be concentrated in a single circle here, now as we go further north or south, as we move closer to the poles, that same amount of sunlight is now spread out over greater surface area. So the angle of the incoming sunlight is lower and that makes the actual sun energy less intense on any given square meter of space on the surface of the earth. So the sun energy is most intense at the equator and it's more diffuse as you move towards the poles. So generally speaking, the sunlight is stronger at the equator than it is at the poles. All right, and that matters because it impacts how air circulates and also dictates precipitation patterns. So if we looked at air circulation, right, the warmest air is going to be right at the equator and warm air rises, right? So we have warm air here at the equator that's rising up. You can see that here in these arrows on the side. So the warm air rises up here, and then as it cools, it drops down. And this is normally around the 30 degree latitudes. That cooler air sinks. And as that cooler air sinks, it's going to flow back down to the equator where it heats back up and then drops again. And then we see the same pattern here. So at it, it causes these air circulations. So the air flowing downward here also moves the air above it down. And that causes these circular air currents. And of course, underneath these flowing air currents, the earth itself is spinning, right? So it's a very dynamic system. There's a lot going on. But this is why we see major differences in ecosystem types at the equator and at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So descending air, dry air absorbs moisture as it falls down, right? And this is why we normally see arid zones and deserts in this latitude. So right around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south is where we find the driest areas. Ascending moist air releases moisture 
So we usually see most of the precipitation should happen right around the equator, right? The places where the warm moist air is rising. And the same is true in the northern and southern hemispheres. We go up to about 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south, where this is where we see more precipitation again. All right, and then of course in all of this we have ocean currents that play a role, right? So we've got warmest energy hitting at the equator, and that's going to send warm air in the northern hemisphere flowing northwest like this. So in the northern hemisphere, the ocean currents spin clockwise. In the southern hemisphere, they're moving counterclockwise. global climate patterns. So other patterns we see that make a difference um, is elevation. So when we have mountain ranges, we usually see more precipitation on the windward side of the mountains. So these clouds that are full of moisture, they're heavy and low hanging. <clears throat> As the wind flows, usually off an ocean or a large body of water, it blows those clouds up to a mountain range and kind of to squeeze over the mountains, these clouds get the precipitation kind of squeegeed out of them. And then the leeward side of the mountains are generally arid and dry. So we often find deserts or just very dry biomes on the leeward side of the mountain. So have a look at this canyon here. There's vegetation on one side of the canyon, but not the other. Why? Well, take a moment and think, which way would you predict the wind is blowing here? Left to right, right to left, front to back. You're right. The predominant wind direction is moving from left to right. So... When warm air comes in, it falls down the canyon. And then as that warm air is trying to rise and get back up and out, that's where most of the precipitation is dropped on this windward side of the canyon, the windward wall of the canyon. Good. All right. So let's talk now about these major biomes or the major types of ecosystems that occupy broad geographic areas. And remember, these are all related to their latitude, basically. What's their angle with the sun? How does that impact air currents, water currents in the ocean, and precipitation patterns? All right. So we see at the equator is generally where we have a lot of moist things happening. So um, like tropical forests, savannas what's purple, high mountains. And then if we go up to like 60 degrees, we have the dark green, which is the Northern Coniferous Forest. And temperate grasslands. And then down here, we see kind of the same sorts of ecosystems at like 60 degrees south. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about each of these. Climate, latitude, and elevation determine the biomes. A climograph is a plot of annual mean or average temperature and precipitation in a particular region. So to interpret this climograph, we've got annual precipitation on the x-axis and annual temperature on the y. So if we have an area with high rainfall and high temperature, that would put us up here, right? A tropical forest. A place that has very little rain and very low temperatures would be something like this, an Arctic or Alpine tundra, right? Makes sense? So that's how we work this, this climate graph. A tropical forest we typically find near the equator where it's warm and there's lots of rainfall. Deserts are going to show up around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And of course they'd have 
high temperatures, but also low precipitation. Savannas, we see a little bit closer to the equator. They have higher rainfall and are very productive grassland ecosystems. Chaparral. So this is an area we see, um, this is the chaparral of California pictured, uh, but it's closer to those um, 30 degree latitudes. So these are drier ecosystems and characterized by a lot of like scrubby short growth, but no trees. Here's a temperate grassland, so further north and south. Northern coniferous forests. So this would be like a little further north than the lower peninsula of Michigan, but kind of just on the other side of Lake Superior, you'd expect to see this type of biome dominating. Temperate broadleaf forest. This is what we're familiar with in Michigan. Tundra is going to be up at like 60 degrees north. If there were land at 60 degrees south, you might also expect to see that down here. Lakes we can see in all over the world, right? Um, but the type of vegetation and the type of ecosystem within that lake is going to depend on sunlight, chemistry of the water and the soil, um, and some other things around it. So here's an oligotrophic lake in Grand Tetons. And an oligotrophic lake is going to be a cold water lake um, that has very little plant growth in it and really high clarity to the water. Basically, the opposite of an oligotrophic lake is a eutrophic lake. A eutrophic lake usually has lots of growth in it, um, lots of plants, algae, um, very low dissolved oxygen, and the water is probably going to be like brown or green and harder to see through. Wetlands. Here's a basin wetland in the United Kingdom. There's three different types of wetlands we have in Michigan. We have cattail marshes, which are the most common. We also have bogs, which are floating moss-based ecosystems over lakes that are usually very um, small but deep. And uh, the water in bogs are acidic. In the third type of wetland we have in Michigan are fens. And fens um, kind of look like this. Uh, it's usually a small lake with, um, you know, like grasses and reeds growing on the sides, but the water in a fen is alkaline or basic. All right, streams and rivers. Um, we all know what these are, but these can be very different types of ecosystems depending on where in the world you'd find them. Estuaries are where rivers flow out into the ocean. And these are nurseries of lots of different organisms. Fish will come to estuaries to lay their eggs. Lots of birds will use the trees around estuaries. Usually it's like mangroves, really thick, dense vegetation, but places where it's hard for mammalian predators to get out. Um, so it's a great place for animals to raise their young. Intertidal zones. So these would be places that are covered by water at high tide, but at low tide, they'll be exposed to the open air. And these are places where lots of different organisms make their home. Things like starfish and different mussels and shellfish, some anemones. The open ocean is called the pelagic zone. And this would be places like where you'd expect to see um, like whales, or dolphins, coral reefs are usually closer to shore and the coral itself are small nadarians, things that are related to jelly, not jellies, um, uh, nadarian, yeah, jellyfish. Sorry, I'm having a moment. Yep. So the coral itself, um, 
you can see like underneath the structures where the living things are, the coral organisms will produce uh, these calcium carbonate structures that build up the structure of the reef itself. All right, and the bottom of the ocean is called the benthos or the benthic zone. And there are some really unusual and specialist uh, organisms that live at the very bottom of the ocean. So this is a picture of a deep sea hydrothermal vent community, a place where hot water is surging out of a vent in the ocean floor. And the heat um, from that vent can be uh, something that makes a local microclimate that's more hospitable for living things. All right, so let's look at some graphs here of temperature over time and precipitation over time and try and see if we can deduce which biome these graphs might represent. So here we have warm summers and cold winters. And by warm summers, I mean 20 degrees Celsius is a little bit cooler than room temperature. So in the summer, it gets just under 70 degrees. And precipitation, there's none in the winter. There's a rainy season, and then it's going to be dry again. So this would be a good example of a tundra, a place where it doesn't get very warm and they don't get a ton of rain. All right, let's look at this next graph. Warm temperatures, so above 70 degrees all year long, and really not very much temperature fluctuation either. And as far as precipitation goes, there's l less precipitation January through May, and then lots of precipitation in lots of precipitation in June through December. So there's a rainy season and a dry season, and it's warm all year long. Maybe even hot all year long would be a good way to say it. Well, this would be a good example of a rainforest. All right, biogeography. This is the geographic distribution. We talked on this a little bit. Dispersal, behavior, biotic factors, and abiotic factors. Um, what factors have influenced the distribution of this species? So here's a butterfly. It lives in southern Sweden, and there's a small population in Finland. So we're looking at the blue range right now. This is their historical range, where we found them for most of human history. But recently, with global climate change, scientists have begun to see this butterfly in parts of Sweden and lots of Finland where we've never seen them before. And they're not just visiting, they're breeding and reproducing in these purple spaces now. So what factors do you think have influenced the spread of this butterfly further north? Oops. Yeah, so it's warmer there, right? What else do you think they might be getting more of at this latitude? Yep, they'll be having more, more rainfall probably. So the whole climate is changing to be a better fit for this organism. Good. Ooh, you might also think about competition, right? Maybe there's some other organism moving into the blue range that's forcing these out. There's lots of good hypotheses and reasons for it, and it would be an excellent thing to study. All right, let's shift gears now, and I want you to think about succession. So succession is how communities proceed through a series of recognizable and predictable changes in structure over time. So if we think about like a, a new island, say a volcano erupts and forms a new island, that island's going to begin as just rock, right? There's no living things on the surface. It's just rock. The first successive communities that will come in, primary succession, the first things that can live there will be lichens and mosses. They can live right on the surface of rock. They don't need soil. And what happens is as these grow on the soil, 
earth, as these grow on the rock, they begin to break it down and build up the first very thin soil layers on the island. Once there's some soil present, then grasses can begin to grow in that shallow soil. So you might have an island that's covered with lichens and mosses and grass now. Well, once enough of the grasses are growing and die, they build up enough of an organic layer in the soil to support the growth of short, low shrubs, right? And then as those shrubs live and die and build up the soil even more, then high shrubs can come in, then shrub trees, and eventually low trees. And as those low trees die off, higher trees come in and take over. So this is the pattern we'd expect to see on a brand new island uh, or brand new anything that's just down to rock, right? And we call this pattern primary succession. A seasonal progression that begins with a total lack of organisms and bare mineral surfaces or water. So here's some lichens. Uh, intermediate stages here. Um, these can survive in the thin layer of soil produced by the pioneer species, the first species there. And some examples are soil microbes, worms, grasses, and legumes. And each successional stage or sear improves the soil quality and is often replaced by the next community. So it moves in a line, a linear progression through time. Finally, at the very end, so the, that high tree stage at the end, that will be a climax community. A relatively stable, long-lasting community that's the result of succession. And a good example of this near us is the pine forest, white pine forest, and Hartwick State Pines and Estevan State Pines up in the UP. They harbor more specialist organisms in a climax community and have greater biodiversity. They also recycle nutrients and maintain a constant biomass. So if you look back here, the biomass of each successive community is increasing, right? There's way more biomass in a high tree community than there is when you have only lichens and mosses. So we're moving in a line here um, where we increase biomass at each successive sear. But once you reach the climax community, the biomass should stay about the same. Secondary succession happens when a community gets set back to an earlier successional stage because of a disturbance. It could be a fire, maybe logging, or landslide, or farming, but some kind of change to the ecosystem. Natural disturbances like forest fires are important for maintaining ecosystem diversity on a landscape. So without disturbance, you'd have all the same kind of community everywhere within an area, right? So having natural disturbances um, are important for helping to maintain diversity. We can mimic this because as humans, we're not really crazy about having wildfires, right? But we can mimic a wildfire to get the benefits of fire, but in a controlled way by doing prescribed burns. All right, let's talk briefly about aquatic succession. So aquatic succession follows the same general principles as terrestrial succession, with the exception of oceans. Most aquatic systems are temporary and constantly transitioning into terrestrial systems because of the buildup of soil and organic material. Now, I'll show you what I mean. So imagine we have an empty ditch, like a brand new ditch that's just been dug maybe. You'd have the first species that would come would be your pioneer species. As those pioneer species die out, early successional species will begin to dominate, but those first things are going to die and their organic matter is going to begin the first layers of soil development at the bottom of this ditch, right? As the early successional species begin to die off, their organic matter will further add to the soil development. And then we have late successional species come next. And of course, when they die, they'll build the soil up even further. And my poorly placed caption is in the way. Okay. 
so then when we get to um, uh, like a climax community here, we'll see like a cattail marsh is dominated by cattails, right? And the water level itself is very shallow, but there's a deep layer of organic sediment or soil. And so this is really important that the soil level is building up with each stage, just like in aquatic succession or in terrestrial succession. We see the same patterns on land and in water, building up this organic material. All right, we know that there's vast biodiversity all over the globe. But what do we know about what's happening to biodiversity right now? Write your thoughts here. What's happening to the diversity of plant uh, species on the planet right now? Yeah, it's declining, right? We're losing species. There's extinctions happening at very high rates right now. So we've got West African rhino went extinct in 2011. The golden toad in 1989. Passenger pigeons in 1914. Tasmanian tigers went extinct in the 1930s. The Dutch Alcon blue butterfly went extinct in 1979. Ibex in 79. Spix macaw in 2004. The Carolina parakeet in 1918. Stellar sea cow in 1768. The Yangtze River Dolphin in 2006. So what is extinction? Write your best summary or paraphrased definition of extinction here. Have extinctions happened in the past or is it something new in the last, what would you say, 1700s? Is extinction new since the 1700s? Well, no, extinctions always happened, right? Can you think of examples of species that existed a long time ago but haven't been around for millions of years? Or maybe even hundreds of millions of years? Jot down an example. Sure. And there's lots, right? Things like dinosaurs or um, uh, trilobites, orthoceros, ammonites. Uh, there's all kinds of really interesting and amazing life forms that have gone extinct. So if we know that the same species haven't always been around, what can we say about biodiversity over the history of our planet? Is the number of species constant or does it change? Well, let's look at what the big pattern of extinction looks like over the entire history of Earth. So if we go back in time, 540 million years ago, we have, so the gray is all genera, or all different types of living things on earth, right? And the red line is the long-term trend. We've got basically peaks and valleys. The number of species is always changing. Things are going extinct but new species are also arising from speciation and the total number of species goes up over time it looks like we've had a great number of species increasing since maybe a hundred million years ago but we also see some major extinction events points where the slope of this line goes down right so we do have mass extinction events that are happening or have happened over the last 500 million years. All right, and as far as recent extinctions go, since humans have been paying attention or keeping track, we've lost 145 bird species since 1500. 79 mammals, 36 amphibians, 324 different snails and clam species have gone extinct. 22 reptiles, 71 different types of fish, 121 flowering plants, gone. Crabs and shrimp, mosses, insects, and even spiders have all 
suffered extinction since the 1500s. All right, and extinctions across some major groups. Here, if we look 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and then 1900 to 2000, we see lots of speciation happening in recent history, right? Now, part of that might just be because we have more scientists on planet Earth watching for these things too. All right, so what's one commonality among our ideas about the causes of extinction and the role of humans? So we could even go back to this graph where we see extinction events happening. What can you say about extinctions and humans? Do you think humans are having an impact on extinction rates? All right, and an example of something you might write here could be, though hunting can be a really good way to control animal populations, humans, including early humans, have hunted a number of animal species to extinction. All right, so let's do some comprehension check questions here. What biomes would you expect to find in Colorado? <clears throat> and define these terms. I'd also like you to take a moment, look at this graph. What do you see on the graph? So, and then what does the information mean? All right, at this point, you should be able to define an ecosystem, describe the structure of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, explain how energy drives the geochemical cycle of elements in an ecosystem, discuss pyramids of energy, biomass, and numbers of an ecosystem, discuss the effects of human activities on ecosystems, explain why precipitation and temperature or altitude influence the type of biome in a given area. Identify the characteristics that vary between biomes and provide examples. And explain the competitive exclusion principle. Describe the process of succession. And as always, if you have any questions, or I'm realizing we didn't talk much about geochemical cycles here, like carbon cycling. We talked about it a little, but if you have questions about this still after you work through your textbook, make sure that you ask, all right? You can bring your questions to my Zoom hours or to the classroom. All right.